Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker. In 1957, Melba Beals was one of nine African-American students chosen to integrate Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. But her story of overcoming didn't start or end there. While her white schoolmates were planning their senior prom, Melba was facing the business end of a double-barreled shotgun being threatened with lynching by rope-carrying tormentors and learning how to outrun white supremacists who were ready to kill her rather than sit beside her in a classroom. Only her faith in God sustained her during her darkest days and helped her become a civil rights warrior, an NBC television news reporter, a magazine writer, a professor, a wife, and a mother. In I Will Not Fear, she takes you on an unforgettable journey through terror, oppression, and persecution, highlighting the kind of faith we all need to survive in a world full of heartbreak and anger. She shows how the deep faith we develop during our most difficult moments is the kind of faith that can change our families, our communities, and even the world. Melba Patilla Beals is a recipient of this country's highest honor, the Congressional Gold Medal for her role as a 15-year-old in the integration of Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. A retired university professor with a doctorate in international multicultural education, she's a former KQED television broadcaster, NBC television news reporter, ABC radio talk show host, and writer for various magazines, including Family Circle and People. Her book, Warriors Don't Cry, has been in print for more than 20 years and sold more than 1 million copies and was the winner of the American Literary Association Award, the Robert F. Kennedy Book Award, and the American Booksellers Association Award. She lives in San Francisco and is a mother of three adult children. Here to discuss her newest release, I Will Not Fear, my story of a lifetime of building faith under fire, is Melba Beals. Melba, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thank you so much. It's my blessing to be here this morning. Well, we are the ones who are blessed. You are an icon. And although your name may, may not be on the lips of uh, as many as some, your contribution to this world has been memorialized in your faith, in your um, resolve, and you're willing to tell the story of what happened to you and as my people, the Jews, uh, are, are, are fond of saying, if we do not remember, it will happen again. And that is why we continue. I to truly tell, believe in that. Yes, we tell your story, and that's what we yes. want to tell today. You know, <clears throat> your book is I Will Not Fear, My Story of a Lifetime of Building Faith Under Fire. And I want to take you back to <clears throat> 1942. You remember 1942? Well, all right. I'm just, 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 just breathing, just bustling, just feeling the warmth of my mother's body and of her love for me. I was born on December seventh, nineteen forty-one, the very day Pearl Harbor was attacked. Yes. But what is what is interesting is that from the beginning, uh, prayer and God played a great role in my life, because. But for the grace of God, I would have died because on the day that my mother gave birth to me, they used forceps on my head and they pulled me into the world. My mother was very tiny. My father was large. I was a large baby. When they pulled me into the world, they injured the right side of my head, which remains somewhat injured today. However, the doctor told them that I would not make it if they did not rinse my head off every few minutes with Epsom salt. There was an African-American man in the room sweeping, and he heard that. But during the next few days, the nurses did nothing. They said, and I quote, we don't want to coddle a nigger. And so by the third day, the minister was called in, and I was dying. And the African-American man, by the way, had been off for Monday. So I'm born on Sunday. The African-American man is off by Tuesday. My temperature is 105. And he walks down the hall and he hears the minister singing and my mother crying. And he said, what's the problem? And they said, well, she's dying. And he said, I guess that their Epsom salts didn't work after all. And my grandmother said, what Epsom salts? And he said, well, the doctor said to rinse her head in it. 
and she would be okay. So my grandmother said, are you kidding? She got her purse, ran to the store, got the Epsom salts, and on the way back, she met the nurse. And that's when the nurse told her she had never had any intention of doing that. And so you see, it was God. It was God. It was God from the beginning who decreed that I should live. And my grandmother always said, you are here for a reason. You are here for a reason. And so from the beginning, they taught me to read by the 23rd Psalms, the Lord's Prayer, and verses in the Bible. From the beginning, it was never the, the Dick and Jane at my house. It was the Bible, the words of the Bible. And from the beginning, my grandmother said to me, God is as close as your skin. Touch your skin. Feel your cheeks. God is that close. He hears you. You need to pray nightly and morningly. You need to thank God and be aware that he provides all the good that is in your life. We must have gratitude, period. What are the 10 things you're grateful for in the morning? And once again, always the reading in the afternoon and the evening of the Bible, verses, chapters, whatever, talking about the heroes of the Bible. So you were immersed. So that was my beginning. You were immersed from the start. <clears throat> when did you find that your faith became your own? Uh, when I was 14 and a half, 15 years of age, and I was standing in a mob across the street from Central High School. Um, of course, I followed the edict of what my mother and grandmother said. But I was a teenager and a child, and I thought, you know, you got to do what these people say if you're going to get any privilege. But in my heart, I questioned it. In my heart, I wondered about the degree of its value. In my heart, sometimes when we sit hour after hour in church, I thought, hmm, do I really belong here? What could I be doing? Boy, this is boring. But on that day, when I was surrounded by a mob, and they were closer to my mother, they were hitting her, and I was in front of her, and they were chasing us away from the school, and they were very clear verbally about what they're going to do to us, I thought, okay, all right, time to try this out, right? Is grandmother telling the truth? And I touched my cheek, and I said, the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. It maketh me lie down. I started to repeat that out loud. And then when that was over, I screamed, Our Father who art in heaven, how do it be thy name? I would come and get me. And I thought that the rescue was going to be the way I envisioned it. But you know what I learned with that? It never, ever is the way I envision it. It's the simple way the Father in heaven envisions it. And what he did was, there were bushes and things across the trail. It was an unconcreted sidewalk. And the group of men who were chasing us with ropes in their arms, uh, smoking these cigars and calling us ugly names and telling us what they were going to do us, guess what? It was simple. I ran around the bushes because I looked down and saw them. They ran over them and fell into them. And like dominoes, one went down, two went down, three went down, four went down. And still I was waiting for the band of angels. Well, voice said, that is the band of angels. And then I ran to the car and got in the car, and we backed down that street faster than I had ever driven forward. And that's when I knew for certain. Religion is mine. God is here. Grandma's right. And I'm going to listen, because I'm not going to make it unless I listen, because these people are serious. When they say they're going to hang me, and they're going to shoot me, and they were serious, and I had to get the, the most important thing I had to learn was, yes, they're serious. And yes, God is with you. Melba, you faced a time in our history where hatred, just because of the color of your skin, was rampant throughout various parts of the nation. Uh, I grew up in Pittsburgh in the 50s, and we had Jewish persecution. There were places we couldn't go. They were, there were clubs we yeah. could not belong to. Um, I remember, and I don't remember where I saw it, but there was a water fountain that said, no blacks or Jews. 
and I remember that vividly from my youth. Absolutely. And so we share, you and I, a ministry of suffering, a ministry of persecution that those who have never walked in the shoes of, of racism or anti-Semitism can only look at it from a theoretical standpoint. But I was called a Christ killer from the time I was seven years old and beat up by the Catholic boys in the neighborhood because I killed Christ. Uh, this was the mantra of the Catholic Church at the time and the kind of persecution that we faced. So I have great compassion for you and great respect for your strength and for your resolve. It was, 1950, it was 1957 when you were chosen to be one of the students to integrate Central High School in Little Rock. What was it you were told and what was it you were thinking when you were one of the ones selected and why do you think you specifically were selected that God would allow you to be a part of this chosen group? I will always wonder why me, but there were 116 other students. And out of those 116, they started to fall away. Now, the criteria was that you had to have good grades. You could not have had any evidence of misbehaving. And you had to have a background in school all the way back through of obedience, uh, a kind of quietness. In other words, you had to be a person who followed orders in school. So I had that. I was a very good girl in my family a religious girl, to church on Sunday, etc. The church many nights a week, let's not just say Sunday. And so my background was clearly what they were looking for. And uh, I was chosen by, by God, I think, because it forever changed my life. And God did that. Um, and when I first went, I had no idea. People say, you're a heroine. Well, none of us had any idea that other human beings, white, black, green, blue, or yellow, were willing to shoot children or kill children. But the circumstance of my wanting to go, you said, how, why did I want to go? As early as three years of age, I realized my parents would leave home in one kind of look and straight shoulders, speaking perfect English, and we get to the grocery store, they'd go to Yauza, Noza. They couldn't pick for any packages off the shelf. Uh, people jumped in front of us in line, right? We had no way of being human. They were in charge. I thought to myself, wait a minute, why are the white people in charge? They own the water fountains, the buses. Uh, they ride in our neighborhoods at night with those white sheets on. They killed a family down the block for me, including the babies. Um, they kill us on Saturday night for sports. I wanted the black adults to do something. By the time I was five, I watched the Klan hang a man on the rafters of my church. 75 people in the church and nobody did anything. Nobody did anything. So what prepared me to want to go to Central High School was not to want to sit next to a white person. I didn't think there were any gifts in it except the gift of my personal freedom the gift of my ability to choose, my voice, and my ability to get along without a clan. And so that's why I went, and that was the background. Now, did I know it was going to be that difficult? The answer is no. I am not that brave. When you were part of this nine, known as the Little Rock Nine, You stood your ground. You faced overwhelming odds. You, it was clear that you were not wanted there. It was clear that this was being forced upon two communities that both had strong feelings towards each other. The African-American community uh, living in fear and oppression, and knowing that there was no crime they committed other than being born with a certain skin color, 
and there was a white community that did not want to be integrated. They wanted to maintain this mob mentality and this control over all things and thought that it was going to denigrate the population, that there was going to be an assimilation, that there was going to be, and the same thing we faced as Jews all throughout history is this difference that was hatred from the pit of hell. It was of man, not of God. Uh, but yet, um, there are photos of you attempting to enter the school. Um, and how did you find that courage to face that? Because of God. Because, because Grandma said, God was with me. Look to your right. Decide where he is. That's first of all. The way I got up the stairs every day was to see how many times I could say the Lord's Prayer. Most days it was 23 times. Now, one of the things that changed my philosophy is, was also Martin Luther King. He said to me one day when I was complaining, we saw him once we were into the school a couple of weeks, and he said, I was complaining. I was saying that people were spitting on me and calling me names and hitting me and kicking me and all of this. And he said to me, Melba. Don't be selfish. You're not doing this for yourself. You're doing this for generations yet unborn. He also made it clear that it was a God-assigned task. My grandmother always said, this is your God-assigned task. Fail to do it this time, and you will have to come back around and do it the next time. This is it. You can't deny that God put you there. Out of 116 people, you end up being one of nine. Among 1,900, by the way. There were 1,900 white kids there. So it was clear. And every time, did I want to leave? You bet I did. Uh, was I sick going to school every single morning and being tortured and beaten and talked about that way? Are you kidding? Of course. I was. I wanted out. But the one thing that kept me going was, Melba, God is with you. God is always with you. And then grandma used to say, when God looks you in the face and says, why did you fail me? Why did you not complete what I assigned you? What will be your answer? That you were a fraidy cat? That it hurt? These cannot be your answers. It is his courage you walk on. Elba, as you look back on she that... She's read that whole thing. You know, she's read that verse, in him I move and live and have my... every every. As you look back on this and you realize that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, this was the message that your grandmother India was sending to you that you needed to answer the call and know that you had yes. to count the cost and the reminder that Jesus paid yes. the price for you so that he could bind up the brokenhearted and set the captives free and you were captive to prejudice to hatred to generation upon generation the same way you were raised up in scripture these are the students who are parent, whose parents passed racism and white supremacy from one generation to the next. As you look back on this time, do you find that we are as evil, as racist, as discriminating as we were then, but we do it through subtlety? and we don't do it as overtly, but have we made up any ground in this battle to recognize that all human beings were created by God and that man looks on the outward appearance, God looks at the heart? We have made some progress, but don't fool yourself. There are some people who are as prejudiced as they were back then. But many people have evolved. 
uh, not long ago, I, 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 I got off the plane in Little Rock, Arkansas, only two weeks ago, going back there to speak for a convention. And the, the woman that met me at the airport, her name is Melissa. She is a white woman who has handled the convening or the celebration of Little Rock Nine for some 20 years. She's this beautiful, loving, God-filled white woman. And I guess people thought I was crazy because when I got off the plane, I screamed because she surprised me in meeting me. She didn't have to do that. It was just me alone and not the whole nine. But she stood there meeting me. And I love her with all my heart. And she, to me, is a refined example of what many people have become. Don't forget, when I came from Central High School seeking refuge, it was a white family that adopted me. Yes. It is a white family that on the 22nd of December, I will have my Christmas dinner with. It is a white sister that I talked to for two hours last night, trying to decide who's going to bring the turkey and who's going to bring the ham. It is a white sister that I talked to almost every night of my life. My attitude certainly was changed by living with the McCabe's, Dr. and Mrs. George McCabe. Have we changed in, in many ways, the system has changed so that people of color have some space to fight back legally, philosophically, mentally. I think they will, they, they, there are these people who don't want to accept us, who don't want to accept anybody other than the blonde folks on their block. But they are learning that we solve problems. We may be able to fix your leaf licking roof. We may be able to help your burning house. The black man who was carrying the hose in the recent campfire in California, what do you want to bet he was welcome? And so what has changed is my brother, for example, is a black man in a blue uniform, having spent 40 years of his life as a policeman. Okay? Everybody didn't agree with that. And it was hard for him to get on the Little Rock Force, but he got on it. So things have changed. Not everybody's come along with the change, but it's changed. Now I can fight for Melba. And back then I, I had no space to. Melba, the body of faith is as divided as the secular world. Our churches are not a tapestry of the culture. Our churches are not representative and reflective of what I would consider to be a cross-cultural, cross-ethnic um, representation of the communities. We have our, uh, divided the body, and Christians are as prone to discrimination and prejudices as non-Christians. And that troubles me because at age 44, when I, as a Jewish boy from Pittsburgh, accepted Jesus as my Messiah, I had to be willing to count the cost of losing 14 million relatives by my profession of faith in Jesus. You had to count the cost because you were born into a world who was not godlike, but they were manlike. And these same people and families that persecuted you went to church on Sunday. They heard messages in That's church right. in church on Sunday. And so what we would think would be the safest place in the world would be in the pulpits of our churches for our African American, our Latino, our Oriental, our um, Indian, our, 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 um, no. Oh, no, no, it's not, it's not the case. And it, it, it breaks my heart as someone who 22 years ago came to faith in Jesus and saw that this was the biggest decision and that I was called by Paul into a ministry of reconciliation. 
When I moved to Birmingham, Alabama, <clears throat> the very first churches that welcomed me to preach were the black churches of Birmingham. And Melba, oh. I, 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 as a Jewish believer, um, would walk in and I would greet everyone and no one would make eye contact with me. Now, we're talking about not 1955, not 1965, not 1975. We're talking about 2006. And I could not have anyone make eye contact with me. And when I got in the pulpit to preach, instead of looking up at me while I was preaching, they were looking down. And I got down off the pulpit and I literally walked up to every person in that congregation as I continued to bring the message and put my hand on their chin and raised it up so that they could look me in the eye. Because they had been generation after generation after generation still to this day of persecution and sub being subjected to a, the white person is there, you must turn your eyes away, do not make eye contact. And I continue to minister in those churches, and I found a heart of God that even in poverty and persecution and the fatherless homes, that I found more of a heart for the Lord from the persecuted than I did from the affluent when I would preach in the mega church with the 15,000. Right? And everybody was just wonderful and applauding and praising the Lord, but they would go out the next day and they would carry their worldly attitudes with them. I would rather be in the impoverished community that loved the Lord and could help them relate to the fact that their Messiah was Jewish, I'm Jewish, and I'm just an ambassador of the Lord to bring a ministry of reconciliation. Eye contact means that you and I are on an eye to eye. This is what God said, is I, I looked at Moses as a friend as one looks at a friend eye to eye. And this is something that still exists today, 2018, Melba, and it breaks it my does. heart it for does. the Lord. And we need to speak out. We need to talk about this. You say, I will not fear your story of a lifetime of building faith under fire. The body of Christ, the black body of Christ, is still under fire. And it's under fire by friendly fire, as much as it's under fire from those we would call white supremacists, the, the Dukes and the Ku Klux Klan. Okay? They're the ones, I can see them, I can recognize them. They're not insidious. They're not coming to me under the covering of the love of Christ. Okay? They're, they're coming to me in an overt way, and I can, okay, I recognize you. You want to kill me because I'm Jewish. They want to kill you because you're black. I get your message. I know who you are. I know you by name. I can Absolutely. find you in the phone book. Okay, but what about the subtle one that says, I love the Lord, all right? but I'm still using racial epitaphs. I'm still not reaching out. I'm still not breaking down this barrier. What is our message? What do we need to no. do? Well, but what about the ones that say, I love you, Melba. I've always loved you in your place. I love colored people like you. I have people actually come to me and say, you know, I love you because you know how to keep your place. You're well behaving, blah, blah, blah. And I have to tell them right off the bat, sweetheart, the only person, the only entity in the world that designates my place is the Lord Jesus. You have nothing to do with that. And so we just have to keep on, keep on keeping on. And I correct even the slightest mistake in conversation. And I don't tell jokes about anybody. I don't allow myself to sit in a group of people that tell jokes about anybody. And for those people who are on their knees on Sunday, but then they grab those white sheets and those burning crosses on Monday, there's a whole group of those people. They will look you in the eye. And what I say is, I love the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus is with me. 
and I have to walk out on the edge of those limbs provided by those people. I have to keep being God's Melba, or they think I've collapsed. I have to be strong. I think the one thing we cannot do, for example, um, I do all the High Holy Days. I have always done the High Holy Days. I do them because I don't make a choice about who you worship. I worship with you, brother. I have a Jewish family. My extended family is Jewish. And we do things together and we are together on these days because I'm going to worship God in whatever form you give me. It doesn't matter what the form is. He knows I'm Melba. He recognizes me. Grandma used to always say, God has your picture on his refrigerator. He loves you. And so these are some of the things when I see people continue, and I do every day, see people continue to have that, I call it the internal devil. Externally, they're beautifully. Beautifully. But then internally, they have this whole little devil club going on, trying to think of ways how to take you down. And you have to be strong. You have to say, I say to them, God is stronger. God is stronger than any entity that will come after me. And, and God has proven that to me every single time. Does that mean I never get off track? Absolutely not. I get off track. I doubt. I whine. I complain. I go on the deck and, and screech to God, listen here. Today, I am not happy with you. But it never fails that the answers come back. I think as Christians, as, as Jews, as what, to see whatever we worship, we tend to look for God to respond to us in the way we think it's going to happen. But it never is that way. And God responds to us sometimes in the simplest, the smallest ways. But I have to tell you, at 77, I'll be 77 on December 7th. At 77, I can tell you that God never fails to respond to me. It may not be what I plan. It may not be what I want. But it always, always has been and has proven to be for my best. Melby, for my best. Melba, you moved to San Francisco and you fought as a pioneer, as the only African-American on-air reporter for PBS and NBC stations in a city that's known for its tolerance, for its welcoming of homosexuality, of, of sanctuary cities, but yet it didn't extend past the color line. There was more favor given to uh, sexually active homosexuals than there were to African Americans. San Francisco has a reputation of being Absolutely. the most, most liberal place in the world, except for, except for. And you had the same experience in trying to buy a home with a real estate um, house hunting trip in this most progressive city in the San Francisco Bay Area. And it's the media that says San Francisco, it's the most liberal place in the world. How then can there still be racism when everything else is acceptable, but there still is a racial divide? How do we justify this, Melba? Because I love you as long as you across the city. I love you. I love that brown skin. I love everything you're doing, Melba. You're such a hero. Don't move in my neighborhood, though, and don't marry my son. Because they don't see the ultimate understanding, which is we are all human. We are all children of a God of some description. Be a child of whatever God you'd like. That's your freedom. I don't have a right to tell you who to worship. But we are all children of a God. And we are all equal. But you see, unless we understand the definition of equality, personal equality, and how it operates and how it's supposed to operate, then we don't get it. So a lot of people, a lot of white people operate on the, you're almost equal, you know, you're within a few inches of it. Keep struggling. Now, I've heard people say to me, 
keep struggling, not in my lifetime. Or, uh, you know I love you, you know you're equal, but I always can tell the difference, you know. And the thing I have to do is keep demonstrating the God life to people and they'll get it. I can do no more than that. I cannot change people. I have people walk up to me when I'm signing books and they say, you know, no matter what, I know you're hairy, you're famous, you're this, you're that, but you're still a nigger. And the only thing I say to them is, did you enjoy my book? What did you get out of it? And they'll say, well, you know, um, I, I'm fearless or I blah, 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 whatever. And I say to them, well, that's all you need. I don't need you to give me freedom. I grasp my freedom from God. My freedom comes in the package. You know how they say batteries included? My battery was included at three. My battery's in there, you know? Whatever was uh, different about me, here I am in Little Rock, Arkansas at age five, and I know, I, hey, I'm in the wrong place, people. My grandmother said, I said, how did I get here? They said, well, the stork brought you. I took my red wagon and parked it outdoors and sat in it. Because you know what? I waited in the sun for the stork to come back. Because I figured if he had delivered me, he was going to deliver other folks, I was going to put my hand up and flag a way out. So from the time of my very first age, batteries installed, I knew that I am free and I am equal. And so what we have to keep doing is knowing, knowing that if we are a child of God, we're free. We're already free. I don't have to ask for that. It's here. I'm not going to get it from you. I'm not going to wrestle it from my neighbor. Doesn't matter what they think. What matters is what I think about me. And the only thing that I can think about me is what God thinks about me. And so as long as you go with those internally stalled batteries that are directly connected to God, then that's what counts. You can't let other people, you know, other people will tell you what they think of you. But the only thing that counts is what God thinks of you. So my work every day, every day I rise off the pillow, has got to be to make sure God is seeing what I do and understanding that I am working for him and for what I'm supposed to do. That's how we keep it straight, you know. Mel People will come mm -hmm. along now. People will come along? Oh, yeah. People will come along and they'll want you to think they're in charge. People come along every day who want to behave like they're in charge. They want to behave like, oh, aren't you nice? Just stay arm's distance away. Or, oh, my goodness, I'm giving you the privilege of being in my presence. Or, oh, you'd be amazed at what people will do if you're African-American in this country. You'd be amazed how people will behave in your presence. Uh, like I've gone house hunting before. And as I write in the book, I had people invite you in and say, you know, I just saw you in the newspaper yesterday. Gosh, you're really famous. I see you're doing some really good community work, but you can't have the apartment, right? This last time I moved, which was only a few months ago, I looked at 49 houses. 49. And how many people, one man was wonderful, he said, hey, these people aren't going to want you here. I can show you the house. You can come back and forth, but I'm not going to give it to you because the neighbors will not want you here. You know, I said to him, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. God bless. Because, you know what? You're saving me time. That does mean you respect me. Thank you for telling me your truth. So it's always going to have folks come along and they think they're in charge. And you have to look at them and you have to every day as an African-American, every single day I know who's in charge. God's in charge. Got me protected, got my task signed, is going to protect me in every way, shape, or form. And I'm just so blessed to have that. Melba, Grandma India raised you with a foundation of faith and a reminder that you were God's beloved and chosen and not to back down from the assignment because you keep getting the assignment until you fulfilled it. Uh, your lifetime has been a testimony to a lifetime of challenges and a lifetime of overcoming. And I'm reminded that Jesus says that I reserve the right for the overcomer 
to sit at my right hand and eat from the tree of life. That he didn't promise us that yes. this road would be easy and that we would face obstacles and we would face uh, all kinds of, of uh, trials and tribulations along our way. But we need to persevere and remain steadfast in our faith. You learn this at an early Absolutely. age. Absolutely. You learn this at an early age, and God has continued to put you on the front line. Did you expect it to be a 77 year long battle? I did not think that the battle would go on this long. I thought that you graduate. You know, I thought you do so much, you get your certificate. You do so much more and you get your certificate. And I remember thinking that and telling my grandmother that I thought that just before she died. And she said, no, honey, um, that's not it. And I have learned, you know, I didn't necessarily believe her, but I have learned very much as I've gotten older that there is no graduation. There is no day of completion. Uh, you do not get to go, you know, I keep saying, where are the golden years? I'm 77. Uh, where is the pleasure and the extended peace and quiet? Well, you know, you have to make it every day, a little every day. And for some of us, there are continued uh, tasks assigned. So whatever the card is that you've been dealt, you need to get up and wipe it off with a little uh, cloth and play it because you have no choice. You have no choice. And gratitude is the key to understanding who you are and what you are and how you're going to get along. Be grateful to God that he's there with you. Most people would say that this is a spiritual battle you're fighting against principalities, that it's spiritual warfare. But through the ages, we've also seen that there is a natural enemy, uh, an accuser, one who incites, one who enlists, one who believes in Jesus, even as the demons believed in Jesus, that uh, we should not be having this conversation in 2018. We should not be facing the inner city challenges that we face. We should not be facing language, which is um, uh, the language used to describe my people, the language to describe me as a Jewish believer, as an ordained rabbi and an ordained Baptist minister, language which is used in a cavalier way that should have never entered our vocabulary and should have been removed and I, oh yeah, I do not chalk it up to ignorance. I chalk it up to intent. There is no one who accidentally uses that language today. Um, unless they intend to use it. You're correct. You're very, very correct. And you have to listen closely. You see, it is my other belief is that listening, listening is the key to the divide, which will be the destruction of our country today. Listening is the key to survival. Listening, listening for the voice of the Lord Jesus, listening to your enemy, listening what is really going on in this universe, listening. My opinion is valuable, but not over everything. Not over everything. I need a period each day to sit quietly in my chair and listen. Listen. What is Father in Heaven saying to me today? What is my neighbor saying? You know, I have this thing that I guess it was a gift from God for sure. And that is this. At night when I lay on the pillow, I can recall every single word of dialogue that I've heard during the day, including if I sat on the bus and heard it. Wherever I heard it, I review it. Did I say anything wrong? Did I miss something? Did I not hear something? And so 
that that is a valuable skill that I've always had that has served me no end. It has very much served me to listen, you know. And sometimes I have days when I don't listen. And those are the days I falter. Melba, what message do you have for this generation? This generation of rampant epidemic fatherlessness. Uh, our inner cities are um, imploding with um, crimes committed against brothers and sisters. Uh, Absolutely. The, but you know, our wealthy, our uh, our wealthy outer cities are imploding with the wealth of opiates. You know, while our inner cities are imploded with poverty and crime, our wealthy young white children are going down the opiate drain. Everybody's got a drain. Just name what the drain is. Right. And the one thing that would work would be to stop, look, and listen, and realize how valuable time is, and you're wasting it. That's number one. And number two, can you sit five minutes and ask yourself, where are you going with this? If you're going to do this today, tomorrow, the next day, and the next day, is there a result here? Is there an outcome? What is the outcome? You know, I'm sitting here and I'm happy today. But excuse me, what is up for you tomorrow? And I tell young people all the time, be grateful for school it is not a gift. It's not a right. It's what is incredibly provided for you out of the grace of God. Some God somewhere. Whoever your God is, that's cool. But it, that, this is not something you should take for granted. And young people these days don't understand the value of everything around us. They didn't work for it, so, you know, it has no value. And what happens is they burn out. Parents push them sometimes, but as a, as a retired professor, I can tell you, that sometimes by the first uh, six weeks of school, we've got eight to 10 kids who've been uh, put out of school because they've been bad. They've been on the roof drunk, they've been smoking in their bedrooms and they've been popping the wrong things. So it's like, stop, look and listen. And for the parents, it's like, it's your job to teach value. If you give everything to your children without discussing its value, then they have no possible way of analyzing what it is they're doing. You know, they're just robbing, they're just stealing, they're just being high. So my prayer is for everybody just to stop, to listen. Please listen. Listen. Melba, how can parents and grandparents take the message of Grandma India and bring it into their own homes. And you are the perfect example of the scripture that says, train up a child in the way they should go. And as they grow older, they will not depart from it. You have been a fighter, a woman of courage, a woman of valor. But in your battle, it has always been God at the forefront your faith, which has been, yes. which has made you fearless, even when you are afraid. Because you continue to press on and break barriers and you continue to do so. We only have about two minutes left in this segment. I'd like you to speak directly to the hearts of the parents that are watching. Their kids are in school. Uh, we're prime time in the Middle East right now. We rotate out all 24 hours, so we had prime time. Uh, you've lived, you say, I will not fear, my story of a lifetime of building faith under fire. You don't have to come under fire to be faithful, but if you're faithful, you might just come under fire. What advice do you have in just two minutes, lasting parting words to leave with our audience? For parents, I would say it's up to you to limit the intake of your children, limit media, limit friendships, whatever. Uh, my, my sons, whom I adopted at 50, 
And my daughter, whom I gave birth to at 25, called me Smother Mother. And, you know, I smile. And I say that is a badge of courage. Yes, I will follow you to the ends of the earth. I will read your mail if it looks not good to me. I will go under your bed and search what you got going on. I will do what it takes to keep you next to the Lord Jesus. And they will tell you that if you interview them, okay? They will say, she is mother, mother. Yes, I will drive you wherever you want to go because I want to know where it is you're going. So for a parent who's going to parent, I'd like for you to put that word on the board, look at, the, look at what that means and take that word seriously because it is you who is the filter for your child. That means you filter media, you filter the books they read. And in order to do that, people, I'm implying here that you're going to have to spend time with them. I spent a tremendous amount of time with my children, with my sons. I was offered a huge entertainment contract at one point, which I laid down. $500,000 advance, I laid down. Because my boys were four, and they were having a terrific time, and I had to spend time with them. I was their only answer, okay? And so that's the first thing. The other thing I say, we all, as human beings, have got to look and listen and be grateful for all the blessings that we have every day. And we have to understand that we are our brother's keeper. We're not here alone. Really? You notice all these fires and these floods? You're going to need your brother, sweetie. Amen. Your brother might have a solution to the flood down your block, okay? So don't stand there like you're by yourself. You're not by yourself. You're, first of all, with the Lord Jesus, who is always with you. But secondarily, love thy neighbor as thyself. How can you love the Lord whom you cannot see in Dutch when you can't love the man next door? Amen. You've got to give it your best. Amen. Melba Patilla Beals, author of I Will Not Fear, My Story of a Lifetime of Building Faith Under Fire, a must read to understand a champion of a cause of faith under fire, one who has shared her experiences going from being part of the Little Arkansas, the uh, um, uh, nine who were selected to uh, integrate. Um, Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, and the journey that she's faced, the discrimination she's faced, but her heart for the Lord and her heart for a fellow man shine through in this book, I Will Not Fear, My Story of a Lifetime of Building Faith Under Fire. Melba Beals, it has been an honor to meet you and to have you as our guest here on Revealing the Truth. It's always my blessing when I get to talk about my Lord Jesus now. Amen. My blessing. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for bless. this opportunity. Thank you. <clears throat> We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.